you know, there are a lot of, we've talked about exploration in a general sense. Uh, there are a lot of explorers of different types um, in the United States and all over the world, um, and they, they all do wonderfully important things. Um, we, tend to, um, we tend to give special recognition to those explorers who um, push out to the edge of uh, the habitable world and particularly who do things that are dangerous in getting there and getting back. And uh, astronauts are w one of those categories of people uh, that are very special in what they do uh, and, and in the approach that they've taken to life to, um, to take those chances in order to move humanity on from the planet of our birth to other places. Uh, Ray Seddon is a very special one of those people and she's, I always call her the first lady of space uh, in Tennessee. She grew up in Murfreesboro and uh, went to the University of California at Berkeley and then she got her medical degree at the University of Tennessee and uh, she was in the first class of shuttle astronauts that had that, that included women. So Sally Ride and Kathy Sullivan and Miss Shannon. Judy. Judy, yeah, mm -hmm. Judy Resnick. Um, and um, so she was in very much on the frontier in a lot of different ways and she's flown three times and I've asked her to, to talk about the flight, but also to talk about her life as a space explorer. So help me welcome Ray Seddon. I'll deal with the technology here and see if I can get myself rigged up so you can hear me. I don't talk very loud, so I'm always ha happy to have a microphone to to help me out with that. Um, I'm delighted. I'm impressed that it's such a large group of, of folks here today um, thinking about uh, exploration and discovery. Um, when I, talk, I begin my talks about space, people are kind of interested uh, to find out how I got interested in space. And I frequently ask the audience a question and I get some hands raised. But I suspect that if I ask the question here, all of you will raise your hand. How many of you remember Sputnik? <laughs> <laughs> Usually the gray hair gives you away. Um, I think we all remember that. I um, was interested that my uh, stepdaughter in high school had to write a paper about something that happened long, long ago. And she chose to write her paper on Sputnik. <laughs> Because to her, it was a long time ago. But in studying that, she was very surprised to find out um, what a momentous sort of thing it was um, and why we got so excited about it. But I think you all remember that and what a frightening experience it was in a way to know that uh, there were things going around the earth that uh, were from a country that uh, uh, we were sort of fighting a Cold War with. And there was a great fear that um, um, rockets were going to rain down upon us from the sky. There was a great fear that technologically the Russians were very ahead of us. And, and what other fields did we not know about uh, were they ahead of us? And uh, I think you all remember that there was great concern that young people in the United States were not uh, getting enough uh, science and engineering. We weren't turning out enough people to deal with this threat. And so there was a big push um, to, to do better with uh, education. And at that time, I found myself um, in a very uh, small town. You maybe remember Murfreesboro back in the 50s. Uh, it was a small country town, mostly farming community. Uh, long way from Nashville at that time. <laughs> it was 32 miles, but it sort of took half the day to get here. Um, and I happened to be in the smallest school in Murfreesboro. It was a small Catholic school called St. Rose, populated mostly by kids from Seward Air Force Base, because we didn't have many Catholics in Murfreesboro. Uh, it was a three-room schoolhouse, eight grades, three nuns, so we were very small and were rather limited in 
what kind of education we got. We got really good basic education, but believe it or not, um, as I approached seventh grade, they realized that the nuns um, were not teaching science. Don't know why. People think that's really odd. I didn't. We had, uh, we had reading, write, reading, writing, and religion instead. Um, and we thought we were doing pretty well, and I think I got a very good basic uh, education. But the nuns were not really qualified to teach science. And so what they did was to import a lay teacher to teach 6th, 7th, and 8th grade science. So 7th grade was when I first began studying science, and I loved it. Maybe it was because it was um, of the moment. People were saying, we need scientists. Um, maybe it was because I hadn't had any of it and it was new. It was exciting to have a teacher that wasn't a nun. But I really liked it. Um, and when people say, when do you remember first getting interested in space? You know, I thought about it, you know, maybe when we went to the moon. And then I kept backing it up and realized that we had a project at the end of seventh grade uh, where we had to do a poster and put information on it. And there was a wonderful Life magazine article. Do you all remember the great pictures and stories in Life magazine? about what might happen to humans when they went into space, when they went away from gravity. And there were all kinds of concerns because people had not gone into space. And um, I chose that article and did my poster on it and put the information and got an A on it and was very proud of myself. Um, but that was my first interest. What would happen to humans when they went into space? And um, all of us remember how we watched the early Mercury flights and the Gemini flights. Of course, Yuri Gargarin, the Russian, flew in space first, and there hadn't been a lot of real science done on weightlessness, but he just went there. The Russian approach was, send him there and see what happens. <laughs> and probably didn't tell us about it till he got safely back home. Um, but we suddenly realized people can go there. Nothing horrible happens to them. And so we began sending our own astronauts into space. We watched them on TV. We stopped school. Um, all of you remember in June of 1969 when we landed on the moon. But as you recall, it was all men. There were women who proved that they could pass the physical exam for NASA. They were all pilots. They didn't have high-performance jet time. And the NASA requirement was that you have to have high-performance jet time and be a jet pilot to be an astronaut. Well, that didn't work for me. My eyesight wasn't good enough, and I didn't really want to be a pilot. So I thought, well, I'm not going to have a chance to do that. But of course, I went to Berkeley in the 60s and realized that the world was changing, and women were saying, why not? Why not women in this field? And um, it was rather odd, even at that time, for women to go into medicine. And yet, that's what I decided I wanted to do. I wanted to be a doctor. And so, um, you know, I was come to think of it, it, was kind of in the forefront. When I entered the University of Tennessee College of Medicine in 1970, uh, it was a class of 115, and there were six women. And women now, are, young women, are really surprised by that, but they just didn't take very many women. But that was changing. Um, and so I thought, well, perhaps someday when I get all my training done, um, they'll want doctors on space stations and maybe um, I'll have a chance uh, to go be a doctor on the space station for a while. That would be fun. Um, and I decided that I wanted to be a surgeon. I kind of liked assessing a problem, seeing if it could be fixed, fixing it, sending the patient back to their primary care doctor. I was not into the cognitive uh, medical specialties. I was really into the doing stuff. So as I marched through this rather odd path, and by the way, they were I was the only woman in my surgery residency when I entered it. So as I got further and further down the road, I, I realized that I was more and more in a man's world, and um, I was comfortable with that. So as I was approaching the end of my residency, um, I was sitting in the intensive care unit, you know, thinking I have another year or so to get through to, to do this. I, you know, I've put too much time into it to quit now. I've got to continue, but man, it was hard. Um, and I was uh, sitting in the doctor's lounge at about 3 o'clock in the morning, babysitting 
a patient in the intensive care unit and one of the neurosurgery residents came in and we were just chatting. And uh, he said, okay, you know, you've got another year or so, I got another year or so, but what would you be doing if you weren't doing this? And I said, I'd go be an astronaut, which was kind of an odd, off the wall thing to say. I'd not really talked to anyone about that. And he said, oh, I did some research for NASA um, before I started my residency. And we chatted about that for a little bit and went on. A couple of weeks later, he passed me in the hall and said, NASA is taking applications for the first space shuttle class of astronauts. And I said, that's interesting. And he said, and they have an affirmative action program. <laughs> they say that they're going to take applications from women and minorities. And I said, where do I apply? And he said, I have no idea. The friend didn't know, he didn't know. So I wrote a letter. I knew that the astronauts trained in Houston someplace. I wrote a letter, NASA, Houston, Texas, <laughs> with a request for an application. Well, the Postal Service did a really good job, and in a few weeks, I received my application. And um, I sort of learned at that point that sometimes um, the, what the government does is they send you a whole stack of papers, and if you're, if you're um, good enough about filling out paperwork, um, um, maybe you're, you're uh, interest, really interested in the job. Um, so I did that. And, um, didn't really think that uh, I had any chance at all, but the requirements were that you had to be in good physical shape, you had to have a degree in science, math, or engineering. They preferred that you have some experience, and of course my, my advanced degree was helpful, and the fact that they counted residency as experience, um, not just more schooling, uh, was in my favor. Well, I got a call from NASA uh, in August of 1977, and they said, would you like to come interview for this job? And I thought, interesting. I said, yes, of course. And I said, how many people are you going to interview? And he said, probably around 220. And I said, how many applied? And he said, about 10,000. <laughs> so I was just honored that I had made the cut down to 220. I went to the Space Center in Houston uh, for a week for interviews, um, for physical exams, pretty rigorous physical exams, um, uh, an interview with the um, selection board, psychiatric evaluations, a lot of um, information about what the shuttle was going to be and what the astronauts, mission specialists as the scientists were called, uh, would be doing. They selected um, pilot astronauts and mission specialist astronauts for the first time. So you didn't have to, um, to have high performance jet time. So I um, finished up the week, enjoyed meeting the people that were in the interview group with me. There were 20 of us, um, several women, um, and went home with all my souvenirs to tell my grandchildren someday that I was interviewed for the astronaut program. Well, in January of 1978, I got a call um, from the director of flight crew operations uh, who asked me if I was still interested in the job. And of course I was. And he said, well, why don't you come down here in July and be part of the 1978 class? So I was absolutely thrilled. I asked how many women they had selected because um, I was not... I was not going to be upset if, if I was the only one or if there were only a couple of us. Uh, but he said they had selected six women in a class of 35. So that was pretty good odds compared to what I had sort of been in before. And I knew that I would have company uh, in getting through <coughs> some pretty interesting uh, evaluation and training. So I joined NASA in July of 1978, just at the end of my surgery residency. And how lucky for me that I was just at the point in my career that I could take a few years off and come back to medicine if I wanted to. Well, it was a most interesting 19 years that I spent with NASA. Um, met my husband, who was a, a fellow uh, member of the 1978 uh, class, a pilot, Navy pilot. And we married and along the way had three children. So um, it took me a long time to get back to health care. Um, but I had a most interesting uh, time. And I was fortunate in 
uh, all of my flights, but particularly the latter two, um, to have the chance to do what I was interested in exploring, and that was what happens to humans when they leave gravity. Back from the seventh grade, that had been what I wanted to know. I wasn't interested in just going someplace. Mm -hmm. You know, when people went to the moon, um, the big task was going there getting there and getting back. And all the, the flights leading up to that and, and some of the flights after that had to do with um, <clears throat> the, the, the actual travel, the rocket science. How do you handle the propulsion systems? How do you do spacewalks? How do you do construction in space? How do you do rendezvous in space? Um, how do you land on the moon? Um, and the, the effort was really focused on getting there and getting home safely. And I was fortunate to have come into NASA <clears throat> at a time <clears throat> when we had answered most of those questions. We wanted to be able to do it better, but what um, we were interested in doing was seeing what we could do with space once we got there, and for me, studying what was going on with the humans so that we could plan for longer duration flights to different places in our solar system and perhaps in our universe. So. I was interested in that part <coughs> of discovery and, and um, exploration, um, really looking at the explorers as they went exploring. And what I'd like to do today is to show you a video uh, from the second of my three flights um, because it begins the study in earnest and in an integrated way on what happens to crew members when they spend some time in space. We also took some other living creatures with us because you can't take as many humans as you'd like to have a, a, um, a, a complement of, of, of uh, uh, subjects for your experiments. Um, there are also things that humans won't let you do to them um, that we've persuaded some of the animals to let us do. Um, so um, you'll see other living creatures so I'm going to show you about a 23-minute video, and I'm, I'm going to talk kind of fast through it because it goes rather quickly, but it illustrates a lot of the things that we were interested in. It will answer some of your questions, but um, towards the end, I'm happy to answer your questions if there are things that I haven't explained to you about what's going on and what the people are doing and why the people are interested in what they're interested in. Um, it's fun to show the video because most people haven't seen a flight, a shuttle flight from beginning to end to know what's gone on and why those things were important and why people did them and what some of the results were. So um, if we can start the video, um, I'll show you uh, what we did. There we are. Every crew for um, a flight gets to design their own patch. If you've ever wondered about patches, sometimes they're designed for flights, but our crew members' names are on there. This is June of 1991, and that's the shuttle in the distance sitting on the pad waiting for us. Here we are um, uh, getting suited up for space. We wear the big orange suits in case we have to bail out after, uh, um, after the launch for some reason. There I am with a little mascot. We took 48 rats on the mission, so uh, we had a, a stuffed mascot. One of the interesting things about this flight um, was that there were three women on the flight. Uh, they asked our commander, was he concerned about having three women? He said he was more concerned about having four doctors who kept trying to talk him into being an experimental subject. <laughs> well, here we are out on the launch pad. You know, they take you up to the top of the shuttle, um, strap you in. Everybody else moves back three and a half miles, and you're out there on the pad all by yourself. They start the main engines, and once they are up to full uh, bore, uh, the boosters ignite. It doesn't look like you're going particularly fast, but by the time you clear the launch tower, you're going over 100 miles an hour. So it is quite a jolt, quite a ride, a lot of noise and vibration, uh, but you're very happy to be on your way. If you come to a launch, um, you always hope it'll be a clear day because if it is, you can see the boosters come off at, at two minutes. Unfortunately, it was a, a little bit cloudy on this day. We were a little concerned we weren't going to launch, but uh, we got off the ground. And in fact, when we went through the clouds, some people gasped because it looked like we took a, a left-hand turn and headed for California. But that's just the shadow of the rocket plume on the top of the clouds. We're heading up that way uh, for space. And it doesn't take very long. 
about eight and a half minutes after launch. Uh, your main engine's uh, shut down, you get rid of the big extra tank and you're in space. There's what the world looks like up above. Thin blue rim of atmosphere, we're up above the atmosphere. You're looking back at the tail of the shuttle and the lab that sits in the back of the cargo bay. When you get to space, one of the first things that you have to do is to learn to move around because it isn't intuitive. Uh, you've never been in an environment like that and, and it takes a while to get used to how you get from place to place without smashing into the walls or getting stuck in the middle of the room. But this is Sid Gutierrez, our pilot, heading down the long tunnel uh, that leads to the, the laboratory itself. He enters with a bit of a flourish just to show you how comfortable he is. Um, but here is our laboratory in space. Uh, imagine taking a science lab, packing all the equipment away, turning it on its side and shaking the heck out of it, and then pulling everything out, uh, hoping that it works, but it did for this flight. Here we are doing some of the experiments for the flight. Uh, Dr. Gaffney over on the right, who by the way is a cardiologist at Vanderbilt, um, has a small catheter threaded up his arm to look at the pressure of the blood coming into the heart. We knew that the, the blood in the body, the fluid in the body redistributed when you got out of gravity. Not as much was pulled into your legs. Everybody assumed that the pressure going into the heart would be high um, and when he measured it, it was low. And that's what science is all about. You, you propose a, a theory of what might happen, then you measure it and sometimes you get it wrong. You have to go back and think about why that is. Here we are doing ultrasound of my heart, again with the fluid redistribution. Uh, we were pretty sure that the heart would have to swell up a bit. That's the valves inside my heart looking actually inside the human body. Um, but then once you got rid of the fluid, the heart would shrink down. The muscle of the heart doesn't have to pump as hard because it's not pumping against gravity. And the muscle actually decreases uh, in the heart, which was interesting. This was an experiment that was looking at a problem that astronauts have when they come back from space. Uh, sometimes when you try to stand up, you get lightheaded because you're not getting enough blood flow to your brain. Uh, and people thought that maybe the problem was that the, the blood vessels of the leg forget to pump, how to pump the blood back up to your heart. They get too stretchy, they get out of shape. And so that's what this experiment is looking at. You can see the blood pressure cuff, you can see all the wiring and everything. We're measuring the stretchiness of the blood vessels in the leg. And again, that didn't change. So we, we wrote that off as, as being one of the problems um, when you go into space. This is looking at kind of the same thing. When you stand up in the morning, your blood pressure drops a little bit, and there are receptors in your neck, in the blood vessels in your neck, that send a message to your brain and to your heart to make your heart go faster. Uh, and in space, you're no longer lying down and standing up, and that reflex doesn't get exercised. And lo and behold, when you go into space, this neck collar sucks on your neck, which drops your blood pressure a little bit, and your heart rate doesn't speed up. That reflex, again, has gotten out of shape, and we kind of were surprised to see that that only took a few days of not exercising that reflex for it to, to uh, diminish. And that was a, kind of a, a surprise to us, but was measurable in all of us, the four of us who were subjects. This is how we exercise on the mid-deck of the shuttle. This is the living quarters. Those are, that's a treadmill with a difference. You can see that he has to have suspenders on to hold him down on the, by, on the treadmill, or he would push against the treadmill and float away. But if you get the suspenders on, cinch them up, you can get a pretty good workout. And this is exercise back in the lab, not a treadmill, but a bicycle, and not um, um, suspenders, but shoulder boards, once again, to hold you down on the bicycle. This was part of an exercise experiment to look at whether or not you could do the same amount of work in space over the course of time if you continued to exercise, to see whether or not you used the same amount of oxygen, gave off the same amount of carbon dioxide. And again, part of it was, can you stay in good shape if you exercise vigorously uh, in space? And we did pretty well. You can see that, uh, that uh, Tammy is floating around monitoring the experiment. Um, this is a, a test that you may have done in your doctor's office. This is lung function test. You've breathed on the machine. One of the problems with doing it the same way as you do on the ground is there are gases that are used that if they were to leak out inside this enclosed container could reach a dangerous level. So it had, the, the experiment had to be reworked to see whether or not 
Um, we could do it and see what lung function would be like. Again, people thought there might be too much fluid around the lungs, but the lungs function quite nicely in space. Um, there's no problem with any additional fluid that might uh, be redistributed towards the chest. Dr. Gaffney over on the right is looking at lung volume. We found that lung volume is somewhat decreased in weightlessness because your stomach and intestines come up against your diaphragm and squash your lungs just a little bit. So the volume is down, but the function stays normal. A number of the tests that we did in space required that we inject tracers into our body, let them be metabolized and distributed, and then withdraw blood samples. You'll see here that we, we really are in weightlessness. Uh, you have to be careful to keep track of things because they tend to, to float away if you don't. Uh, but we found that people lose calcium from their bones, they lose uh, protein from their muscles, they come back from space with fewer red blood cells, a form of anemia. The white blood cells that usually fight infection are not as robust. So many different things are going on inside your body that you wouldn't be able to tell unless you were able to, uh, to draw blood and bring back specimens to be analyzed on the ground. And we kind of look like drug addicts when we got back, though, from all those blood draws. This is part of a control experiment. If you remember your science classes, you have something that's an experimental um, um, uh, piece of, of, of material, and then you have to have a control. If you put cells inside a centrifuge and spin the centrifuge, this centrifugal force generates gravity out near the edge or partial, partial gravity, and that's what that was. Little kids want to know, how do you go to the bathroom in space? Well, we have an airflow system that pulls the, the waste away from you, and if you're going to collect urine specimens, like over on the right, and look at the volume of, volume of urine, you have to separate air from the urine, and that's what this device does. One of the big advantages of the space shuttle, and why I'll be sorry to see the space shuttle program go away, is we had large freezers where we could bring back lots of samples. If you've seen the nose cones that they've flown in before, there's not much room to bring stuff back. This is lunch in space. Uh, people want to know, well, what do you eat? Well, as you can imagine, on a, on a mission that's looking at, at your human physiology, you want to make sure that your diet is normal and you're getting all the right nutrients. Um, like on the ground. So here we are. We, uh, we tend to play with our food just a little bit. Those are not Frisbees that we're munching on. Those are tortillas. Uh, if you've ever looked at the bottom of the bread bag at home, you know that there are lots of crumbs down in there. In space, if you pull a piece of bread out of a bread bag, all the crumbs come out, get in your eyes, get in your nose. And uh, we learned some lessons from that, so we fly tortillas, which don't make crumbs. But you can see we have the silver drink containers. We're eating with a spoon. As long as the food has liquid on it, it'll stick to the spoon if you're careful. Uh, we take dried foods. Dr. Um, Gaffney down here has uh, dried uh, apricots. Uh, we have casseroles and little containers. Um, and just to make sure we're eating enough and not too much, this is how you weigh yourself in space. <coughs> have you ever wondered how, how you could keep track of your weight? You climb in this chair, strap yourself in, and you release a spring. And the heavier you are, the slower the spring rocks back and forth. A computer can look at that and get your mass and calculate your weight. So you can weigh yourself in space even when you're weightless. Um, and the one system in your body that senses gravity, really, is your inner ear. We have sensors with fluid in them that, that uh, tell you about rotation. We have hair cells in there that react to, to bending forward and backwards. And we'll tell you where up and down are. And so this is an experiment to look at that. If you've ever done this in, at home in the chair when you were a kid, you know that if you spin long enough, you lose the sensation of mo motion. And then if you stop, you think you're going back the other way. Your eyes jiggle a bit. But you know where up and down are. You get very confused when you do something like that in space. You feel like you're tumbling. Your eyes do strange things. And that's what they were looking at. What, what happens to the inner ear when, when, um, when you're in weightlessness? And what really happens that you can tell yourself is that you begin to not pay any attention to your inner ear. Because you can be moving and not sense it, or you can be still and feel like you're moving, so you begin to ignore your inner ear. You become much more dependent on your eyes. When you're standing like this on the ground and you look in the dome, you're very sure that you are standing still and the dome is rotating. But when you get into space, you've learned to ignore your inner ear, depend on your eyes, and you start this dome rotating and you're very sure that the dome is standing still and you are whirling around like a, a propeller. 
It's a very odd sensation. It's kind of like when you, you're in a car and the car next to you backs out. You think you're moving forward. Again, it's because of your eyes telling you something different than your inner ear. This is recess in space. The kids like to watch this. And uh, we had the opportunity one evening, we'd finished all our work, we put all of our equipment down and to use this large volume to just goof off and, and relax a little bit. Sid, our pilot, said he bet he could do a push-up with everybody else on his back. So that's him down at the bottom. And you can see that he's not going to have any trouble at all with all of us stacked up there. It's the guy on the, the top that's uh, having the trouble <laughs> as he gets smashed into the ceiling. But again, weightlessness is great fun to play in. We decided we would knock this off uh, and all be Olympic gymnasts. And you can see that uh, we're having fun flipping and turning and, and looking at uh, our lab from upside down. And we had become very uh, comfortable with being weightless at this point in time. At first, you can be a little seasick when you get up there. Uh, but we, had in, we were enjoying it. This is what a sunset looks like in space. You go around the Earth every 90 minutes. So 45 minutes after this, there's a sunrise. And then 45 minutes after that is a sunset. Um, so it was fun to, to watch that. This is doing noise measurements. If you read OSHA standards about how much noise you can have in your work environment. Uh, remember, we, we live in our work environment, so we were very concerned about the, the levels of noise being made by all of the equipment. Um, this is looking out the window. The interesting thing about it is when you first get there and you look out the window, you have absolutely no idea where you are. You look at a scene like that and say, where is that? Well, if I told you that over on the right-hand side is the Strait of Gibraltar, we're coming across the Atlantic, this is Spain, that's Africa, coming into the Mediterranean, you'd say, oh, now I recognize it. This is a bit more recognizable for those of you who, who, who know Italy. We get lots of uh, lectures and training on geology, geography, oceanography, meteorology, so we can look out the window and understand what it is we're seeing. Because sometimes we're asked to take pictures of what's going on. Um, this is uh, just after the first Persian Gulf War. These are the Kuwaiti oil field fires. The satellites weren't very good at picking up the smoke over the water, and so the ground asked us to take some pictures um, to understand the smoke patterns, um, because you can see those with your eyes and with your camera. This is coming down from north to south down the coast of California. This is San Francisco Bay disappearing out the bottom of the picture. We're really kind of coming down uh, right over the San Andreas Fault. Over on the left, you can see snow on the Sierra Nevadas, see the, um, the uh, fog over the ocean. It looks like you're drifting in a hot air balloon. It is beautiful to watch. But if you want to take a picture of something, you better have your camera ready because this is nine minutes later, and this is the Chesapeake Bay. So you cross the whole United States in nine minutes. If you have to go downstairs to get the camera, you'll be on the other side of the world by the time you get it back up there to take the picture. Uh, beautiful scenery, beautiful things to look at. Again, very peaceful and restful. You feel like you're drifting slowly, and you get to see an awful lot of the world. On every space shuttle flight, they take some piece of equipment um, uh, or several pieces of equipment that need to be tested that are going to be used uh, for part of an experiment in a later flight. This is a workbench uh, you, that you might see in a lab. It's all enclosed because some of the stuff that you use for experiments, you wouldn't want to get loose in the cabin. So this is an enclosed area, and we're testing it out to see if we put liquids and solids inside if they stay inside. So that's strawberry fruit punch. It's nice and colorful. The cameras pick it up. We're squeezing it out. Interesting to see um, how fluids act in space. You see if you impart enough momentum and a big enough blob, it'll float around until it hits something, sometimes break into smaller parts. But everything stayed inside. This is looking at solids. This is a low-tech. It's a balloon with food bars and black-eyed peas inside. We're going to pop it with this uh, pin. Uh, kind of spectacular. But the point was, does everything stay inside? And it did. So the workbench passed its initial test to tell us that it would keep stuff inside. These are our animal cages looking inside. You remember I said we took 48 rats? We were responsible for them, so we had to make sure that they were getting their water and their food. They were moving around and healthy. Uh, and they were. And the, the animal cages were working well. They had flown on an earlier flight and leaked. And um, that was not a good thing. Uh, to have animal waste floating around in your cabin. So this was another test of the animal cages, but they were working quite well. We asked the ground if we could pull one of the cages into this sock-like device that we had taken along for emergencies. Uh, we could pull a cage in there, close the door in the front, 
take the cage over to the workbench and slide the cage in and take one of the animals out. Now animals had not been handled in space before and no one knew what they would do, whether they would get aggressive, try to bite, try to get away from you, be hard to handle. So this is kind of an unplanned test, but something that we thought would be very useful to know for a later flight where they would have to handle the animals. So here we go. Got a leather glove on in case the animal tries to bite as you take it out of the cage. Um, and you can see that uh, pretty healthy looking rat. Uh, and what he's trying to do is hold on for dear life. <laughs> he has been in weightlessness, but in a very small enclosed area. Uh, but he's not comfortable with being out in an open space. Um, it's hard to know what his sensations are, but he really wants to hold on. We're going to try to let him go without exciting him to see once he gets loose, what is he going to do and how could we get him back if, if we needed to, if one got loose out in the cabin someplace. So we're going to try to encourage him uh, and you can see he becomes a, a gymnast. But mostly what he's looking for is, what do I hold on to? And so we, we were very comfortable in the fact that the animals could be handled, and uh, if they got away, we would have a way of getting them back. The little plastic cone with a hole down at the far end is how we carry the animals around in the lab. They're very used to it. They usually run in there because it's nice and cozy. But you can see without gravity, um, this rat uh, can't really get a grip. He doesn't know what to do and he's trying to make a U-turn. So again, sort of learning the differences in how they react to being uh, in space. But um, we can take a lot more rats into space than we can with humans. We did the same tests on them that were being done on the humans during this flight to see what systems they're good models for. They are good for some, not so good for others. Um, so that's important to know that you can't draw an analogy on what, everything that happens to a rat will happen to humans. This is how we had taken rats before in, in a drawer. You can see them in, uh, in there, but we couldn't take them out, so there was no way to test them during the flight to see the time course of any changes. These are very interesting little animals. Those are little tiny jellyfish, just barely big enough to see. Jellyfish kind of start life as a plant on the bottom of the ocean, and to be able to swim around, they develop gravity sensors, and the question was, could they develop gravity sensors in the absence of gravity, and they did. So that was kind of interesting. Again, a, a very simple system that we could see into. Uh, have you ever thought about if you got dehydrated in space, how they would drip IV fluids into you? Well, this is a piece of equipment that they use in hospitals. It's an IV pump, and they wanted to know, would an IV pump work in weightlessness in case we needed to put IV fluids into somebody? Um, this is an exam table. We had a physician propose an experiment where uh, we would test out an exam table. Do you need an exam table in space? I don't know. We, we took it up, we tested it uh, to see whether or not the patient would stay in one place, all your equipment could stay there. This is not a real person on the table. This is not Sid the pilot from the last scene. This is Recessa Annie, for those of you who have done CPR. We are doing advanced CPR on this patient. You can't lean on the chest to pump the heart, so we have a lever, we have an IV, and, and all of the equipment that you would use just in case you needed to, to do CPR. Uh, again, nobody had ever uh, required stitches in space, and people wondered, can you, can you put stitches in? Can you keep the patient tied down? Can you keep all your equipment from floating away? Can you keep the surgeon um, stable enough to do uh, close work? Um, can you keep the field sterile? And we tried that out, and it worked quite well. We finished nine days of flight. It was time to come home. We had some insulation in the back uh, where the door was going to come closed, and we weren't sure this door was going to be able to close. But I think you can see that it just pushes the insulation out of the way, and the door comes nicely down into the latch. You have to be able to close those payload bay doors to be able to come home. Now, we have um, two people on every flight that are trained to go out uh, with spacesuits and close the doors manually. And those two people on this flight were very disappointed they weren't going to get to do a spacewalk, uh, but the rest of us were pretty happy that the doors came home, uh, came closed uh, automatically as they should so that we could get ready to come home. Uh, in order to, to do our entry, we put on the big orange suits again, and you can imagine what it's like to get those things on while you're floating around. Um, but we did, and uh, here we are. This is the flight deck. This is the cockpit. We have computer screens that we monitor our entry on. If you'll remember, we're up above the Earth's atmosphere. We're going 17,500 miles an hour. 
And as you enter the atmosphere, um, you hit the air molecules and you're going very fast. The air molecules heat up and you look out your window and it gets brighter and brighter. You look back at the tail and it looks like Zeus is firing lightning bolts at you. But you're very aware of the fact that, that you really are in a very hot environment. As you recall, uh, Columbia didn't make it through um, the heating region. Um, but you're, you're unaware of the heat inside except from looking outside because it's comfortable and you're protected inside the cabin. Um, and of course, next to launch, uh, that period is uh, probably the, the riskiest part uh, of a flight. Uh, here we are. The, the space shuttle is a large glider. It doesn't have any engines or propellers. It can't go around and try the landing again. Uh, it's a 100-ton glider, the world's largest, uh, and you have to land it properly the first time. If you can imagine all of the, the changes that have taken place with the, within the pilots, um, they have to be using little different systems, um, their eyes more, more um, than their inner ear and the seat of their pants, to do the landings, but they all do them quite nicely. My husband landed the shuttle on four of his five flights and um, did it quite well. Um, uh, and it can be done, and it's landed manually every time. Most crews get out and walk around the shuttle and uh, sort of show the world they're back and they're healthy. But we had to go back to the lab and have tests begun right away to see how we readapted to being back on the ground. We had been tested before we left. We had seen how we changed over nine days in space, and now we had to see how quickly we got back to being normal again. And so that's why we got into this people, people mover and uh, moved back to the lab for um, an, another 10 days of um, testing uh, to see how we got back to normal. Um, you can feel pretty well after a couple of days, but they can still pick up differences uh, in, in the way you are up and uh, beyond 10 days, in fact. Nice Tennessee bumper sticker in the back. We do get to take a few things to remind us of home. Um, a most interesting uh, nine-day flight. My third flight was kind of a follow-on to this. We got more subjects. One of the things that um, that was interesting to me was for the first time we we had gotten uh, good information on women. Uh, you may remember the Skylab flights um, in the 1970s, uh, but there were only men on those flights, and the things that they had found gave us some clues as to what might be going on. But there was always the question, did women react to being in space differently than the men, and they don't. So we sort of laid that to rest. But we were able to test many systems to see how they interact with each other. Uh, on some of the flights, they had done blood draws or they had done vestibular experiments or cardiac um, uh, tests. But on this flight, we tested many different systems and we could see how they interacted, what we call integrative physiology. Um, so that was very exciting to me. This was the first flight um, in the Na NASA history that was dedicated entirely to life sciences. And I was very honored to be a part of that. Um, I'm often asked, well, what, you know, what is the big picture that, that you learned from uh, this kind of flight? You know, it, it definitely told us some things about flying in space, uh, but people say, well, if we decide not to go into space, what use is it? But, you know, to me, it showed us a lot of things about what happens to the human body when it tries to adapt to a new environment. If you think about it, in our whole evolutionary history, we have not been weightless. And yet when we go into space, the body makes some changes. And if you think about it and you look at it, there really are adaptive changes that make you better suited to living in that environment. You don't need strong bones. You don't need strong muscles. Uh, maybe living in an enclosed area, you don't need uh, an immune system that, that works in the same way. So what the body does is it says, where am I? What's different? And how do I adapt to where I am? Um, and then it very quickly, when you get back home, uh, readapts to being on the ground. So it's remarkable to see, but it shows us some of the things that gravity does for us. Uh, and in understanding that, I think we will help people here on the ground. How does gravity keep calcium in your bones? I don't know, is it a biochemical or mechanical force on the bones? Uh, that would be good to know. And being able to take research animals with us, we can actually bring the bones back home and, and look at the bones. Again, most astronauts don't want to donate a leg bone to you, um, but being able to take animals or, or living things uh, into space, uh, we can begin to see exactly what happens. 
the other thing that, that is amazing to me is to know that um, the body doesn't waste its energy on maintaining systems that are not used. The body's very efficient. And if you don't use your muscles, it doesn't maintain them. You lose the protein out of them and they get weaker. And that's very obvious in young, healthy people flying in space. Um, even your reflexes, I mean, most of us thought that the nervous system was hardwired. You know, it doesn't change. But you could see changes in the, the inner ear wiring of rats when we brought them back home and tested them. So the nervous system itself the reflexes that maintain your blood pressure, that help you move about in gravity, um, can change and adapt. And if you don't use them, um, they're not going to be there when you need them. And so I think that all of us as we get older have to remember that you have to put a little stress and a little strain on your body uh, in order for your body to maintain those systems that you want to continue to use. Um, and so I try to remember that every day as I get up and think I don't want to go to the gym, um, I go anyway. Um, so I've managed to keep myself in pretty good shape and I hope I can persuade other people to do the same. So if you'd like, I think we have time for some questions and I would be happy to answer some questions for you. Yes, I will. Yes, sir. The question was, um, do we have any thoughts about uh, repairing a blood vessel, an artery or vein that might be damaged um, in space? And um, it's kind of a tough one. Um, uh, the question, my third flight, we did animal dissections and we learned a little bit about containing blood and, and, and things like that. Um, we do take a medical kit with some, some surgical instruments in it. Um, I, I think that uh, one of the problems would be it, it, is if you had some injury inside one of the spacesuits. Most of our space operations take place in a shirt sleeve environment, as you saw us in the lab, so that if you cut yourself badly, you could do the same things that you could do here on the ground. Put on a tourniquet, put pressure on it, uh, go to the medical kit, get some things that you could grab that artery with, tie it off with uh, some, um, some surgical suture. Um, so. I think that the, the main concern would be um, if you were in a spacesuit and you had a crush injury, and that would mean that uh, you would have to um, get inside, get out of the suit fairly quickly. One of the issues on the, my, um, you saw the catheter that was threaded up Dr. Gaffney's arm uh, in that first scene. Uh, he had that inserted before launch, had a dressing put on it and uh, then put on his spacesuit. There was concern in the safety community what would happen if that catheter came out um, because um, uh, he had the spacesuit on uh, for several hours on the launch pad and then as we got into space, it took a while to get out of that suit. Um, but we, we sort of felt that there was a way to put compression on that area and that we could stop the launch sequence. I mean, we could, until the time we actually launched, we could abort the launch and take care of it. And then there was not too much time before we would get to space. We could get his space suit off and again get to that artery. So um, a lot of the, the um, ideas are, um, you know, this is how we think we'll do it. Um, again, like putting in s stitches and doing CPR, um, at some point in time you may want to be able to, to practice on an animal, see if you've got the right equipment to do it. And of course the space shuttle, um, if you have a severe injury can get home within 12 to 24 hours. Uh, even on space station, they have an emergency escape capability, so you could get home pretty quickly. So they don't carry an awful lot of equipment for severe injuries. Now, if you go to Mars, probably going to have to take a good bit more stuff, and there will be a lot of thought put into what can you do, what are you, would you be trained to do, um, what would be possible, what would be different about being in weightlessness for perhaps a year to get to Mars, a year on the surface, and a year to get home. Uh, how, how do you provide medical care? It's a whole different problem. Um, but there has been some thought about it. Yes, sir, right here. Uh, what's the longest tenure of uh, anyone in space, and what sort of position are they in when they got back? Uh, the question was, what's the longest anyone has stayed in space, and what kind of shape were they in when they came back? 
The Russians had a, a physician who stayed in space for 444 days. And he was very determined to stay in good shape uh, while he was up there. He exercised vigorously. Um, he was in excellent shape when he left. He came home in pretty good shape uh, and suffered no long-term effects that I, I know of. I know that the Russians have done some studies on calcium loss. They saw how low your calcium, the calcium in your bones had dropped while you were in space and um, how quickly you put it back on. And uh, some people never did get all the calcium back in their bones. So that's, that's one of those areas that we really have to, to think a little bit about. Um, certainly, um, NASA is concerned if you want to go into space, even on space station for six months at a time, if you start out with low bone calcium. Uh, that it's more likely to be women that have that problem. Um, and the question is if you fly after menopause, if you don't have your estrogen on board, will you lose a lot more calcium? We haven't answered that yet. Did you have another? Yes, one of my questions was any outcome from this research related to the actual effects of uh, maintaining calcium in the bone system? Yes, um, there have been a number of studies done um, looking at both um, um, impact exercises. You saw the treadmill where you do have some impact uh, on resistance exercises like pushing against bungees to see um, whether they keep calcium in the bones. Um, there's some things proposed where when um, you're um, asleep at night, whether you could, could put vibratory pressure on the bones uh, to keep calcium in. I couldn't tell you all of the, the studies that have taken place uh, in the most, most recent years about what that has shown, but they have found even with exercising two hours a day on space station, you still lose muscle, you still lose bone, not quite as much, but um, they haven't figured out how to make that level off. Many of the changes that take place when you go into space, you reach kind of a new equilibrium. You, you don't have as many red blood cells, and, um, but you reach a, a new level and it, it's stable. But we continue to use, lose calcium from our bones for as long as people have stayed in space, so we don't know where that equilibrium is. And it approaches a dangerous level. Uh, after you've been there for nine months or so. So um, that's one of the kind of showstoppers for, for long duration flight. Yeah, yeah. that was my question. Mm -hmm. <coughs> irreversible damage. Uh, I can't see how people can ever stay in a low Well, the, the question was, uh, are there changes that are irreversible? Um, I think the, the only one we really know about now is... Um, is the calcium loss because as we get older it gets harder to put calcium back in if you lose it. Um, they have begun um, using some of the osteoporosis drugs in space uh, and they seem to work quite well. One of the interesting things to me though was the rats that we brought back from space and we looked at their bones. Yes, they, they had less bone, um, uh, less calcium in the bone than animals that stayed on the ground. And the rats were still growing in space, and the bone that they did lay down had a different structure than the bone here on the ground. So the question is, you know, you may be able to, to um, rebuild bone, uh, remodel bone in space, but will, will it be the, the same kind of bone as you have here on the ground? Will it have the same strength characteristics? And, and that's a question. I think the other thing that we don't know that may be irreversible about flying in space is the radiation. Uh, there's really no indication that, that astronauts have had radiation effects um, in going to low Earth orbit or going a, f a few flights to the moon. Um, but we don't really understand the radiation and its biological effect in interplanetary space. So I suspect and I hope before we send people to Mars that we will send some Pathfinder missions out. <coughs> Um, with some tissues, with some animals that we can get back and look at so we'll understand a little bit better. Astronauts go back to NASA every year to get a physical exam. They have a longitudinal study of astronaut health to see whether or not there are things that happen to us that are unexpected. Um, we have a compar large comparison group um, to see. Uh, astronauts 
the one thing that they have picked up is astronauts tend to die more frequently of traumatic injuries. And that's because we're all risk takers, right? Uh, you know, we've had 70-year-old, 75-year-old uh, astronauts die trying to cl climb Mount Everest of high altitude sickness. Um, one that Pete Conrad that you may remember um, was out riding his motorcycle up a mountain and ran off the edge of the road. Um, so, and a lot of them with flying accidents, they continue to fly and um, you know fly high performance planes. My husband being one of them. Um, so there, you, there's more risk taking behavior, um, but they've also found that um, there, there's probably more cancer in astronauts. But the question is, if you take a young population who doesn't have high blood pressure, who isn't obese, who doesn't have diabetes, who doesn't have any kind of chronic illnesses, and you make them astronauts, they probably have less tendency to die of the, the illnesses that usually affect older Americans. And so probably the cancer is, is a result of that, although we don't really know. It's something that we have to watch. Astronauts, some of the astronauts who have flown high altitude missions um, or flown to the moon have a little more tendency to, to develop cataracts. And cataracts, as you may know, m may be due to, to uh, solar radiation. If you don't wear your sunglasses, you're more prone to, to have those. So we're looking at that and we're studying it. But um, that'll be interesting to see whether or not there are irreversible changes that we need to warn astronauts about before they go on long duration missions. There may be some things that uh, um, will be not as good as before and, and we can't do anything about that. I think we owe it to them um, to at least tell them and warn them and make sure that they want to go anyway. Uh, yes, sir. You came back to the States. Did you go back when you finished with NASA? Did you go back into surgery or what did you do after? Um, I spent 19 years with NASA, made three shuttle flights, had three kids, um, supported my husband through his five flights. And then I came back to Vanderbilt as the assistant chief medical officer and um, definitely didn't want to do surgery because I hadn't done surgery um, in 19 years. I had practiced emergency medicine on the weekends uh, during my time uh, at uh, NASA because that was something I could do on a shift basis. But I was feeling pretty rusty at that. Um, so I was offered an administrative position and again took the assistant chief medical officer position and tried to figure out some things that I had learned at NASA that could be applied to healthcare and it was kind of a stretch. Uh, luckily uh, uh, the chief medical officer at the time, Dr. John Surgent, some of you may know him, he's a wonderful man and he was um, a mentor and we tried to figure out what I knew how to do. Um, I knew about systems thinking, how does the system operate? How do you improve the processes? How do you look at the way the processes go? So I worked on safety, quality, process improvement. Um, and about halfway through my tenure at NASA, uh, at Vanderbilt, um, found that there was a, a group of pilots uh, in Memphis that taught teamwork and communication called crew resource management uh, in the world of aviation. Uh, they had set up a company and, and the airlines and the military had outsourced the training to them. And they wanted to adapt that for healthcare. Wouldn't that be great if your doctor and your nurse talked to each other and, um, and if the nurse saw something was going wrong, she was, she, he or she was willing to speak up to the doctor and say, excuse me, but I think we're going to operate on the other side. Um, <laughs> so we helped um, this group adapt what they knew how to do and what was in the background of everything I did at NASA uh, and in aviation. Um, you know, before we f made a flight, we would brief it. What are we going to do today? Well, healthcare has gotten the, the message about that, and the regulatory agencies are now beginning to require certain things that if you know aviation, you see that it's come directly from aviation. Uh, doctors now are supposed to do before every procedure what's called a timeout. Everybody that's going to work on the procedure takes a timeout. Do we have the right patient? Are we doing the right procedure? Are we doing it on the right side? Do we have all the equipment that we need to do it? Very brief and concise, but it has saved lots of wrong surgeries. And um, readbacks, when uh, air traffic control tells a pilot uh, climb and maintain flight level 350, the pilot must repeat that back, climbing to 350 and the ground listens. Now it's required if a doctor gives a nurse a verbal order, 
give this patient 50 milligrams of Benadryl IV. The nurse says 50 milligrams of Benadryl IV and the, the physician answers. So all of the safeguards that have made aviation so safe are coming in now uh, to healthcare and it's wonderful to see but, but um, the, the, um, um, the company that was founded with the pilots out of Memphis I'm a partner in and I left Vanderbilt a couple of years ago and now work with that company to take this message all over the country and it's, it's great to see um, people once you teach them the skills that they need to have um, uh, to work better as a team, it makes it a much better place to work if everybody is on the same page, everybody's cordial and respectful of one another, and uh, you can cross-check and keep each other out of trouble. Um, we've had uh, great success, and, and that's what I've had fun doing. Again, applying what I learned in my second career to my fourth career. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, having a lot of fun doing that. Yes. Question here. Is there any interest um, in plant physiology in relation to space? The question was plant physiology. Any, any um, interest in that? And yes, there really is because what we would like to do when we make long duration missions is have what's called a closed loop ecological system meaning plants would serve the same purpose as they serve here on the ground. They take up carbon dioxide and let off oxygen, and the cycle continues uh, as we take up the oxygen and give off the carbon dioxide. They also provide food, and, um, and uh, hopefully we will be able to grow some of our food on the long duration missions. If you have to take all of your food when you go to Mars, um, you, you use up a lot of your capacity um, taking food along. Uh, can you imagine taking food for three years? It would be nice if we could grow things. So there have been a number of experiments on plant physiology. Uh, the plants grow the same way. They tend to grow towards the light. Their roots get a little confused because roots tend to grow towards uh, against gravity and the roots do strange things. So there's a lot to be learned, but it's going to be interesting to see. I think the Russians on, on one of their space um, stations grew um, green plants for salads. So there is some, some uh, precedent there. So it'll be interesting to see how, how well we're able to do it. The, one of the problems is, of course, that you're far, we're far enough from the sun and we're in an enclosed area and you don't get as much sunlight as you'd like, so you have to use uh, lights. And that uses up electricity and that uses up fuel. So you know whether you use the, the fuel to grow the plants or use the fuel to get there uh, quicker. Um, We'll have to see, but there's lots of interest in that. It's very fascinating to watch and see what they're what they're thinking about. One of the things that they found they they drew grew uh, tree seedlings to see whether or not there's a, a stuff called lignin um, in a in a tree stem that make it grow up against gravity, kind of like your bones help you stay upright. And the the lignin didn't form very well in weightlessness because what it does is it grows against gravity. So, interesting things. Um, one here. Is there a, a, an age limit on astronauts, and what is the age uh, of the oldest astronaut subject? And were there any significant differences in the older versus the younger? The question was, uh, are there any upper age limits on astronauts, and there aren't? You have to pass a physical every year. Um, most astronauts leave after they've made several flights so that they sort of give younger people a, a chance. Um, I think probably John Young was the oldest, or maybe Story Musgrave, uh, flew in their 60s and did nicely. Um, of course, the oldest fellow to fly in space was John Young, I mean, uh, John Glenn. And um, there weren't many physiologic differences. He was in good shape before he left. Um, there were no major uh, differences from being older. Uh, he w underwent the same adaptive changes when he got up there. People ask me, are you afraid for his health when he goes into space? And I said no, as long as he can do the training before space. You saw the big orange suits. When you put your orange suit on and your helmet and your, and your parachute and your, all your survival gear, weighs about 120 pounds. And um, you have to be able to do emergency escape training 
in Florida and in Houston with all this stuff on. Um, so, you know, if he can pass that, <laughs> he can go into space easily, and he did quite well. So there is no upper age limit um, um, as long as you're in good shape. Other questions? One in the back. The question was, would, uh, would a spinning spaceship using centrifugal force be a good substitute? And it would. Uh, the question is building a structure big enough so that uh, you can generate one gravity. The question is, do you need one gravity? By going back to the moon, which has one-seventh gravity, uh, we can answer, is one-seventh gravity enough to reverse a lot of the changes? We had hoped on space station to have a centrifuge long, large enough to fly small monkeys, to, to say, you know, it, Mars is one-third gravity. Can you go there and rehabilitate and then come home? Um, so how much gravity is enough? We don't know. If you have to do 1G, the, the diameter of the space station needed to, uh, to generate that is really, really large. Um, and we don't quite know if there are uh, changes in the body due to that kind of rotation. Um, so that would have to be studied. Um, but there are people out there who are proponents of having, of doing more studies on the spin because that would possibly uh, uh, keep you healthy uh, and reverse all the, the changes that you find dangerous um, on going to Mars. But there are people who are studying that and who, uh, who think that's the way to go. We'd we could quit doing some of the, the studies that we're doing now. Yes, sir. Hey, and any chance of making the spaceship go faster so they could go right back in, say, a year and a half? Questions of making the spaceship go faster, and yes, there, there are a number of kind of far out um, um, ideas about how you could get, um, get to, uh, to Mars faster. Um, there's one, one of the astronauts is working on a plasma engine that collects the, the space plasma um, and shoots it out the back end and, and gets you going really fast uh, using the solar wind, which is the particles coming off the sun, uh, using uh, nuclear reactors of some sort. Uh, there are many people that are studying that, and, and I have no doubt that, that probably that's what we'll do is, is we'll have some way of getting there a little bit faster. Um, usually, I mean, when... When you think about it, when we went to the moon, all you needed to really do is boost yourself and get the momentum going, and then you don't have to use a lot of fuel necessarily um, to get there. You drift, and um, you use gravity. You know, they use the moon's gravity to sling them around and come back. So you didn't have to use an awful lot of, uh, of, uh, of fuel and power once you got going, and, and we think that maybe there's a way to get going a little bit faster. So we'll have to see a lot of interesting engineering and propulsion ideas, rocket science at work. Other questions? Yes, sir. There's a recent question here to a number of individuals, I think, in the space program. Would they go on a, on a mission where they knew they couldn't come back? And a hyperforce would say, yes, they would. Yep. You could say, well, also, what about the irreversible physical changes? Maybe that would right. Um, that, that's a, an issue. Um, they've done studies or, or surveys where they said, would you go to Mars if you, if you knew that you couldn't come back? Or would you go if you knew that there were irreversible changes, that you would be debilitated in some way when you got back? And there are people that would do that. Uh, the question is, is that ethical? And that's one of the things that we thought about a lot at NASA. You know, when I first joined the space program, uh, and you were, if you were assigned to a flight and you said, yes, I'll go, it meant that you accepted whatever was put on that flight. Whatever experiments, whatever studies, whatever work was to be done, uh, you, if you wanted to go, you had to accept that. And then in the, the late 80s, early, late 80s, I think, um, they, they found that NASA had been part of the radiation uh, experiments that had been done on people without their knowledge in the 50s. And NASA uh, really wanted to make sure they were not doing the wrong thing. And so we had a large group of people that looked at bioethics, what's ethical. And now if you're going to go on a space mission and you're one of the crews that might, people that might be on the crew, and there are experiments to be done like were done on my flight, you have to be informed of those before you go. 
and you have to agree to do them. And some people get the briefing and decide they don't want to do that. Other people say, you know, what are the risks and what, are, what am I asked to do? You know, I told you we had radioisotopes injected into us. Um, so they could quantify the risk for those. Um, and so you had to be willing to do it. And, you know, for us, the, the benefits outweighed the risk. So um, I think that that will come down to kind of an ethical question at some point in time, um, knowing and, and being able to be informed about what's going to happen and what the risks are. I think that's kind of important. That's why we do the studies. Uh, you know, we could probably send people to, to Mars pretty quickly if all we needed were the propulsion systems and the supplies and things like that. But uh, we wouldn't be able to tell them what the risk was. Um, and so perhaps at some point in time we'll decide to do that. And we decide as long as they know and they understand what's going to happen, then they're free to sign up if they want to. I don't know. I'm kind of one of those people that would like to think that we could quantify the risk um, and have people that we get back um, so they can tell us about what they did when they were there. Yes, ma'am. Um, in uh, around uh, 2003, 2004, something like that, there was quite a bit of programming on television and on and it mentioned in the flight to the moon, they expressed doubt that they actually made the moon flight because there was like no wind on the moon, but the flag was blowing. And this made me know, just really wonder, and, and why did they do that? Why did they well, you know, there, there are conspiracy uh, theories about just about everything. Um, and I have seen, um, um, I've seen a lot of the questions that were raised, and there have been shows on TV that answered those questions. NASA could say, well, the reason that it looked like the wind was blowing was because um, we had a, a wire at the top of that flag that, that gave it a wiggle so that it would stand out. If you didn't have that there, the flag would have just drooped because it, there is one seventh gravity, and it wouldn't have made a very pretty flag. So they put a wire on one side, and they rippled it so that it looked like it was a waving flag. Um, you know, I, I, I've had the opportunity to talk with people who have been on the moon, and I can assure you that they have been there. And, I, you know, there, there, were, there were a dozen of them, and you would think that if it was a hoax, one of them as they got older or they would leave behind in their, in their memoirs that we didn't really go there, we were out in the desert someplace. Um, but the actual, the, if you watched astronauts move about on the moon, you know, it would be hard to fake that, the way they jumped around and the way things, uh, and the rocks that they brought back were unique. Y you, you don't find them here on Earth. So, you know, the people that say we didn't really go to the moon, uh, you know, I, I think they are not thinking in the, the right direction. But I think, as with many great things or, or bad things that have happened, there will always be people that, that don't believe the story. Yes, ma'am, here in the front. Um, I guess it's kind of the same subject, but the, um, was it the Challenger that yes. was launched? Yes. And did they, uh, had they solved the problem that the Challenger had? The question about the, the, the Challenger accident, um, um, as you recall, the problem was on one of the boosters, a hole opened up and the booster burned through and, and um, burned into the the large fuel tank and everything exploded. Um, there, before we flew again, NASA wanted to make sure that that problem was solved. And my husband worked on that problem a good bit. We learned a lot about how cold affected the boosters. We had, um, the boosters uh, segments were, were built, put together and tested out in Utah. And they had never been tested below 57 degrees. And on the morning of the Challenger launch, it was, had been down in the 20s overnight. Uh, that was probably the, one of the main problems. But there were, as with all aviation accidents, and my husband told me about this the day of Challenger, we will probably find it was not one single thing. And indeed, if you, if you read the, the final Challenger report, there were other things that went on. Um, there was more wind uh, that day. At different altitudes, the wind goes in different directions. So the vehicle has to wiggle a little bit. And so the high winds that day were probably a factor in opening up that, that crack on the side uh, between the booster segments. Um, 
that segment had been shipped to the Cape and you sh they are shipped on their sides and so one side flattens out and then once you stand them up at the Cape for a while they, they recircularize. Well this one hadn't stood up for very long so it was probably flatter on one side. So there were a number of little things that came together on that day um, that caused that. But they fixed every one of them. Even things that they thought might be the problem, they fixed. And one of the problems with Challenger is that we had some, seen some indication that there might be some burning inside that we had ignored. It's called a normalization of deviance. In other words, it wasn't supposed to happen, but nothing bad came about, so we ignored it. And so NASA's been very careful now to analyze things and to worry about things that give kind of an early indication of failure. Um, they should have thought a little harder. You know, the Columbia uh, flight, um, some insulation came off the tank and hit the wing. But we'd had insulation coming off that tank for a long time, I remember on my first flight seeing bits of it coming by and streaking the windshield. It's like styrofoam. But apparently this was a different um, part of the insulation uh, that might have had some ice in it um, that tore apart the front part of the wing, tore a hole in it. And again, it was a bad decision to not, not worry about that any more than they did. But it is an extremely complex machine. It's a miracle to me every time. It goes and comes back. Um, I can remember watching the first launch saying, there's no way this thing is <laughs> going to get there and get home. There's so many pieces and parts. And on every flight, the, the mission management team makes hundreds of decisions about do we worry about that or not worry about that? What do we do? What do we not do? Um, what can we do? Um, and so, you know, they've made some bad decisions to launch um, Challenger was one to, uh, to not worry more about. Columbia was another. But it's kind of miraculous that they've, they've done as well as they've done so far. Are we about out of time? Okay. I'll do one more, right?